so really grateful for you, Brett, and all, all that you do for us. Uh, if you have a Bible, open to Psalm 1, or if you've got a piece of paper on the way in, please take that out. We're looking at Psalm 1 tonight. Uh, for those of you I don't know, my name's Brandon Sutton. I'm the associate pastor of the church. I get to oversee this ministry we call Recovery and Redemption. Back in 2007, uh, the Lord graciously redeemed my life and, and really just completely transformed my life. I, for years, was addicted to drugs and alcohol and just on down the line you can go. I was in and out of jail. 2004, 2006 was just in and out of jail for me. Um, spent a lot of time living in a recovery home back in Lebanon, Indiana, strangely enough. Um, and the reason I say that is... It, then in the summer of 2007 is when God just transformed my life. And the reason I tell you that is because you might not know me, many of you, but there's a real sense in which I know you. Because I've been where you're sitting, and I have walked in the shoes that many of you are walking in right now. Um, I know what it's like to be in the first few days of recovery. I know what it's like to be in the first few years of recovery. Um, so, as I speak to you tonight from Scripture, know that it's coming from a man um, who understands and who empathizes with where you're at tonight. And so, we're looking at Psalm number one tonight. And the reason, if you've been here for a while, we've been going through the Gospel of Mark together. And the reason uh, we're going to take a break from Mark is because I want you to look at the Psalms with me. And really, I have just really one motivation for doing this is I hope and I pray that as we go through a few psalms together, the next four weeks, we're going to look at four psalms, um, that you would have just a little bit of a, a love for the book of Psalms. So that you would go home and wake up in the morning or go to bed at night or maybe on your lunch break and just open up the book of Psalms and read it. And, you know, all scripture is God-breathed, all scripture is profitable, but the book of Psalms is a place where you will find a refuge for your soul. You will encounter the Lord in the book of Psalms, I think, um, perhaps like any other book in the Bible. And I just want you to have that gift. I want you to see that in the scriptures, in this book, um, some really incredible things will be revealed to you. And you might be wondering, like, why at a recovery meeting are we going through the Gospel of Mark? Why are we going through the, the Psalms together? And it's really simple. Recovery boils down to one thing, and that is a relationship with God through Christ. You can have all the things in the world. You can have all... The world's riches, all the world's material possessions, you could be sober for a hundred years, but if you don't know Christ, if you don't have God in your life, then what do you really have? Jesus said you can gain the whole world, but forfeit your soul. And what good is that? What does it profit you? And I can tell you one thing, after being sober now for 15 years, God is our recovery. He is our recovery. And I don't care if you're recovering from drugs or alcohol or sex or gambling or overeating or whatever it may be. Fill in the blank with whatever sin you came here battling tonight. Your solution is Christ. He is new life. And in him you will find hope and healing and transformation that the world cannot offer you. And tonight when we look at Psalm number 1. We're looking at the introduction to this book, and it really just highlights two things for us, really two ways to live. And you have two choices in this life, two choices before you tonight. You can live the life and go down the path of the blessed person, or you can go down the path of the wicked person. There's only two choices in this life, to follow the ways of Christ, and it leads to life, and happiness, and joy, or to choose your sin which will lead to misery, destruction, and judgment. Look at Psalm number one with me. It says this in verse one, Blessed is the man, and that just means the person. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. Let's pray together. 
Lord, as we now look at your word tonight and we seek to know you and to grow in our faith, we pray uh, that you would teach us, instruct us from your word. And I just pray a special prayer, Lord, that there would be um, just an infectious love from this psalm to um, infiltrate the hearts of men and women, men and women tonight to have a love for the book of Psalms, that they would go home and treasure this book because it truly is a gift from God. And I pray tonight as we unpack this, we would see that there are only two ways to live in this life, Lord, and that is the way of Christ or it is the way of the world. And I ask that you would show us Jesus as incomparably glorious as we just sung. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. God wants you to be happy. And I wonder if you believe that. You've probably been to church and they'll tell you God's not concerned about your happiness. He's concerned about your obedience. How many of you have heard that? God just wants you to obey, doesn't he? He's not concerned about you being happy. Now I know that every person in this room wants to be happy. In fact, I could make a case that everything you do in life is towards the ends and goals of trying to be happy. That's just the way that we're wired. We desire happiness and fulfillment. What I'm wondering, though, is if you believe that God also desires your happiness. Because I'm convinced that many people don't believe that. And I'm convinced also that many people run from God Because they don't believe God wants them to be happy. In fact, they believe that God's rules are so restrictive that to follow the Lord and what he desires will not lead to their happiness. And so they run from God. They think that God's rules are too legalistic. His ways are too harsh. And so they say, I'm going to go my own way and I'm going to pursue my own path of happiness. I think this is what Adam and Eve did. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, God told the man, listen, you can do whatever you want, eat from whatever tree you want, just that one tree you cannot have, otherwise you will die. But the serpent comes along and he tells a different story. He says, you're not going to die if you eat that. God knows if you eat of that tree, you'll, you'll be like him, you'll know good and evil, you'll become like God. He's actually holding out on you. And so what happens is Eve and the man both eat from the tree that God told them not to. Why? Because they thought to disobey the Lord's rules would pursue or that allow them to pursue happiness. They thought to obey God would mean that they were not getting to participate in something that would bring them a higher joy, a higher knowledge, a higher level of happiness. And so what they did is they ran from God and pursued their own will and it led to their destruction. And here's what I'm telling you. I think a lot of people think this. And just think about this, if this has been true for you. Many people think there are two options when it comes to God. I can either follow the Lord, be a good boy, be a good girl, go to church, do the right thing, obey God, and it's going to be a boring, mundane life. Or I can go do my own thing, forget God, and actually have happiness. Do what I want, do what excites me. Yeah, it might be wrong, but it brings me pleasure, it brings me some level of satisfaction. I think that most people think that you have to choose one or the other, obedience or happiness. And here's what I'm here to tell you tonight, is that in Scripture, they are one and the same. That there's not this distinction, there's not this dichotomy of I can either obey God and be a good boy, or I can be happy doing my own thing. Actually, the Bible says this, that you were made to know God You were made to obey God, but here's the deal. In doing so, you were made to find your highest joy in God. God desires you to be eternally happy. He desires you to be happy in this life and maximally happy in the next life. And here's the deal. In fact, when you stray from God, that is what's going to lead to your misery and your ruin. And we know that because we have strayed away from the Lord long enough and we have found misery. How many of you know your sin brings you misery? You've been maybe homeless on the street. Maybe you've been to jail for far too long. Maybe you're in and out of prison for far too long. And your sin has brought you nothing but misery and pain and suffering. And the Lord's saying, if you follow my ways and my rules and Seek me, you will actually find in me your highest joy and your highest satisfaction. And you you know how I know that's true? Think about the cross of Christ. 
You know how I know God wants your joy? The cross of Christ was designed for you to be forgiven of your sins, to be reconciled to God. Why? So you can spend eternity with God in heaven forever, enjoying pleasures of joy in his presence forever. That was God's design, was to glorify himself and to bring you the highest joy in him, in Christ. Listen to these passages of scripture, Psalm 1611. David says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Why did we seek our sin? Was it not for pleasure? Was it not for happiness and joy? The Lord says this, there is more joy and pleasure in me than there is in sin. Romans 15, 13, Paul says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Fill you with joy. And Jesus says this, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Listen, God is not a cosmic killjoy. Christianity is not about ruining your good time. God is actually going after your highest joy. And listen, here's what the Lord is saying. When you go after your sin, you're actually settling for far less than God has desired for you. C.S. Lewis would, would say like this, God is ready to take you on a holiday, which is a British way for vac saying vacation. God is ready to take you on a vacation by the sea, and you're too satisfied playing in the mud. That's what it's like when you go after your sin and forsake the Lord. He's ready to take you on the most glamorous vacation possible, and you're saying, no, I'd rather hang out in the slums. Because I'm having so much fun here. Christ calls himself the bread of life because he satisfies hunger. Christ says he gives the rivers of living water because he can quench your thirst. The reason you have gone off after your sin is because you are seeking happiness and you are going after salt water when you're dying of thirst and he offers you living water to satisfy your soul and so you have a choice and this psalm really lays it out for us a choice of picking either I'm going to live the blessed life the satisfied life following the Lord and his ways or I'm going to pick the way of the wicked the way of of destruction and misery there's two choices that lie before you follow the Lord or follow your sin so let me just walk through this psalm with you. And there's, there's two persons here. There's the blessed person and the cursed person. We'll look at one at a time. First, the blessed person. And if you look at that word blessed, that's actually the word happy. It's the same word when you just unpack it in the Hebrew, unpack it in the original language. The word blessed here is happy. So what he's saying is happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So when we think about pursuing happiness in our lives, oftentimes we think about the things we can do, the things we can have, the places we can go, a house or a car or a job or a vacation or, or some type of material possessions, things that we can gain. But David actually says here that the blessed person is defined by what he doesn't do. By what he doesn't do. Look back at the text. He says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. By the way, the wicked in this text are, are unbelievers. They're the ones who reject the Lord. And David says that you will be blessed if you don't listen to them. You will be blessed if you follow the advice, rather, of godly people instead of ungodly people. If you'll seek the wisdom of Christ instead of the wisdom, so-called wisdom of the world. Proverbs 14.7 says, leave the presence of a fool. For there you do not meet words of knowledge. The second thing he says the blessed man doesn't do is stand in the way of sinners. This is referring to the company he keeps. Not only does he not listen to fools, he doesn't spend a lot of time around them. Because he knows he eventually will become like them. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Some of you need to check your friends group. Some of you need to look at who you've been spending time with. Because if you hang around fools, guess what? You're going to become a fool. And if you listen to foolish people, 
you're bound to do foolish things. Finally, he says that the blessed man does not sit in the seat of scoffers. He doesn't listen to them. He doesn't spend time with them. And he does not live like them. He doesn't enjoy spending time with them. Why would he? They scoff, they mock, they scorn the God he loves. They hate the gospel that has saved his soul. Why would you want to hang around people who hate the God who saved you? That's why he's saying, blessed is the man who doesn't spend time with them. Now listen, I'm not saying you have to hate those people or can't love those people or even try to help those people. What he's saying here, that's not what he's talking about. What he's saying is he's not going to spend a bunch of time hanging around them because they don't share the same values as him. Who you spend your time with matters. And it's really a depiction and an evidence of which path you've chosen. I mentor a man in a prison in Indiana years ago. And when I was mentoring him and spending time with him, and he was growing in his faith, he was growing in his prayer life, knowledge of the word, he was serving in the chapel there, really, really growing a lot. But over time, he started hanging around some guys that weren't going to church like he did, weren't studying the word like he did. They were involved in some other things. And I noticed his attitude began to change. His language began to change. And eventually, he just fell away from everything that was helping him. A few months later, my father actually told me that uh, this guy, he came by my dad's shop. My dad owns a business in Indianapolis. And he was looking for me, this man that I mentored. And my dad said he was strung out. He looked like he had been using drugs. He fell back into his old lifestyle. If you want to live a, a happy life and not fall into the ways of fools, you need to look at the people you hang out with. Do you hang around ungodly people? Do you listen to them? Do you spend lots of time with them? Join in with their conversations and words and actions? David says here that the blessed person who's following the Lord doesn't do those things. Instead, it says his delight is in the law of the Lord, verse 2. So it says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way of sinners, sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. So the blessed person doesn't hang out with those old friend groups. You know when you trying to change your life, you ever heard the expression you need to change people, places, and things? And if nothing changes, nothing changes. You can't expect different results if you're constantly doing the same thing. And what you see here is that the time that he has, he invests in the law of the Lord. That's just another way to say the word of God. We would say the Bible. The blessed person loves the Bible. Why? Because the Bible is the word of God. The Bible reveals the God he loves in the gospel that has saved his soul. The Bible is his daily food for his soul. The Bible is comforting in its promises. It's refreshing and it's good news. The Bible is absolute truth by which we live. The Bible gives commands that we follow. It is the word of the Lord. It is our rule for life. And so if you look at it, it's not just that he reads the Bible. What's it say? He delights in it. He delights in the law of the Lord. And listen, this is what separates the believer from the unbeliever. What they delight in. I would just ask you this question tonight, and this is one of the best litmus tests for your soul. Do you love the Word of God? Do you love it? Or is it boring to you? Is it irrelevant to you? If the Bible is boring and irrelevant to you, it's because you don't know God. The one who knows and loves God knows and loves His Word. The Bible is everything to us because it reveals the God who saved us. The cursed person delights in sin. The cursed person delights in the world. The cursed person hates the word of God. But the blessed man who's following the Lord loves his word. Another question to ask is, what are your thoughts centered upon all day long? 
David says here that he doesn't just delight in the law of the Lord. He says he meditates on it day and night. So David was a very busy man, but what he did was he had God's word in his mind, and he would think about it. He would roll it over in his mind. He would meditate on it. That's what Christian meditation is. It's taking a truth and it's thinking about it. And so this is what separates a believer from an unbeliever. An unbeliever thinks about himself or herself, thinks about the ways of the world and all the things that are going on in the world and their life. Christians aren't perfect, but Christians often think of the Lord. You know, when I first got saved, this was something that was, was so much different in my life is throughout the day, I would think about God. I would think about his word. This is why the Bible says this in Romans. Those who live according to the flesh, which is according to unbelief, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit, the things of Christ, the things of God's word. It says, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. So think about not only where you invest your time, but where's your thinking at each day? And if you're like me, your thinking needs to be transformed because my thinking is what got me in trouble. My mind was completely screwed up, and in many ways today I still need a lot of help. The scriptures are what transform our minds. The scriptures are what renew us day by day. And if you look at verse 3, the man who invests himself in the word of God is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Our kids pastor, Nick Judd, he just preached here a couple weeks ago. He said that Psalm 1 is a depiction of a man who is who's not only blessed, but it's a picture of a good man who lives a stable life. And men, I just want to speak to you directly right now. I know in your heart and in your soul, every single one of you, you have a desire to be a good man, don't you? You've seen older men in your life or maybe in your family, and you look at that person and you say, you know what, he's a good man. I would like to be like him. I wish I was more like him. It's part of being created in the image of God. You desire to be a good person. And ladies, that's true for you too. You want to be a good woman. You want to be a good mother, a good wife. Psalm 1 is a depiction of that person. And look, look what it says here. Because they love God, they love God's word, they seek to live according to it. They're like a tree that's planted near streams of water. I, I used to go on fishing trips in Canada every year when I was a kid, and you would see on the bank, on the shore, you'd see trees growing through rocks. How do they do that? How do they survive? It's because they're planted near water. Water is washing over their roots, and, and they flourish. They grow, and, and that's what he's depicting here. The blessed man is nourished and grows by the word of God, and the growth he's talking about, the flourishing he's talking about is spiritual flourishing. This is a person that lives for God and his kingdom. This is why Jesus said, you are the, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me bears much fruit. In fact, he says, in everything that he does, everything that he does, he prospers. Even in his sufferings, even in his hard times, the blessed man is prospering. Why? Because he knows God. Even in suffering. And do you notice, look back at what it says in verse 3. His leaf does not wither. You notice how hot it's been lately? You notice how burnt up the grass and the trees have been? David says that the blessed man, even under the worst conditions, his leaf does not wither. Why? Because he is constantly nourished by God. So listen, even through hardship and pain and suffering, which every person will face, you will be blessed and prosperous in Christ. I'm not talking about finances and material wealth. I'm talking about you always can have in Christ, no matter what's happening in your life, joy and peace and hope. Joy, peace, hope, and stability in Christ. That's the life of the blessed person. Unshakable joy. Unbreakable hope. Peace that surpasses understanding despite your circumstances. And then, everlasting life with the Lord. 
But now look at back with me in verse 4. You look at the cursed person. It says, the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. So whatever was said for the blessed man is not true for the wicked person. Again, the wicked are unbelievers. Or in this text, it would be people who don't know the Lord, people who reject the Lord. That's how the Bible describes unbelievers. And it's not how I see them. I don't look at non-Christians and say, Man, that person's wicked. I, that's just not how I see the world. But that's how God sees the world. God looks at the world and he sees two kinds of people. He sees the righteous and the wicked. And we're not righteous. Christians aren't righteous because we're better than anyone else. We're righteous in Christ. And the wicked here, they have nothing that the blessed person has. They, they do take counsel from unbelievers. The wicked do like hanging out with those who hate God. They do enjoy those who scoff and scorn the name of the Lord they love. That's who they hang out with. And they don't delight in God's word like the blessed person. They delight in sin. They delight in the world. And because of that, he says they're like chaff. And, and this is just an old imagery of how they used to harvest grain. In Israel, they would bring in grain. And the way that you separated the grain from what you didn't want from the stock is you'd throw the grain up in the air, the stock up in the air, and the, the wind would literally blow the chaff, blow all the stuff you did not want off of the stock, and you would just keep the grain. And so the wind would blow the chaff away. And the chaff was just worthless particles. There was worth nothing. It was only worthy to be burned. And he says that's the way the wicked are. In the eyes of the Lord, that's how the wicked are. They are worthless to God. They are of no use to the Lord. And this might sound really harsh to you, like, man, this is, Christianity is, is really not a nice religion. But listen, it's because God is absolutely and perfectly holy. I know many of us, and I've been there too, in these, a lot of these recovery programs and, and different rooms where you're, you're told you can believe in whatever God that you want. And it's true, you can. It's just not going to do you any good. Because there's only one God. Despite what you'll hear with all these religions in the world, with all these different belief systems and people who make up their own God in their own image and in their own mind. Friends, listen, there is one God in heaven. And he is holy, he is righteous, and he is good. And, and here's the thing, even if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you don't believe the Bible, you know that that's true. You know in your heart and in your mind there is one true and living God, and he doesn't tolerate sin. He doesn't tolerate unrighteousness. And this is why you and I need a redeemer in Christ. This is why we need a savior who dies in the place of sinners who sheds his blood to wash away our transgressions. This is why we can't save ourselves because our sin separates us from God. That's why it says in verse 5, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous for the Lord knows the way of the righteous but the way of the wicked will perish. Listen, if you do not have a savior to stand with you before our holy God, then we're like the wicked who will perish. We'll be held accountable for our sins. And so I want to close. I want to give you just a few takeaways, some practical things, things I've already told you. Number one, watch the company you keep. Like honestly, take a look at your friend group. The people that you hang around matter. Have you ever heard the expression, if you hang around the barbershop long enough, you get a haircut? Listen, if you hang around people that are doing foolish things, saying foolish things, you're eventually going to be just like them, if you're not already. Proverbs 13 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. You will become like the people you hang around. Maybe it's time to evaluate that friend group and think, you know what, if I'm trying to live a new life, these people aren't really helping me. Number two, devote yourself to the word of God. Again, go home and read the Psalms. Commit to that. Get up tomorrow morning, pick a Psalm, take some time to read it, and just thank God for the truths that are in it. Ask God to reveal himself 
in this incredible book that has blessed Christians for a long time. And it will bless you too. And number three and finally, there is a day of judgment coming. This text makes it very clear. The Bible is just replete with this teaching. There is a day of judgment that is coming. There is a day that this world will stop operating in the way that it does now. And listen, it may be like a slow moving train, but that day will arrive. And on that day, the Lord is going to bring into account every man and woman ever made in his image. And here's the deal. You will either be found in your own sin or you will be found in Christ. You will be accountable for every word, deed, and every thought, every sin committed. And the Lord is a righteous judge who will overlook nothing. Or you can be found in the Redeemer who washes away your sins. Don't think today that you have to pick yourself up by your own bootstraps to be a better person so that God will accept you. Nothing can take away your sins but the blood of Christ. And he offers you that today. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you're far from the Lord, the Lord invites you to come to him through Jesus, through the one who died upon the cross for sinners and was raised from the dead. He invites you to be forgiven and reconciled to God. Remember, you have two choices in this life, only two, to follow the way of sin and misery or to follow the Lord who will bring you joy. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you that you have revealed your truth to us and that we do have options in this life, Lord. We have We have the choice set before us, life or death. You offer us healing and hope and peace and joy in Christ, an eternal life that is incomparable. Or you offer, Lord, us the opportunity to choose our own way, our sin and our misery. And that's exactly what it is. So I pray today, Lord, that uh, for Christians in this room, they would just rejoice in the truths that have been communicated and rejoice in the, the grace of God that has saved them and continue to delight themselves in your word, strengthen themselves in your word. Lord, and I pray for those who don't know Christ tonight. I ask that by your spirit, Lord, you would change their hearts, grant them repentance and faith and the ability to walk a new life. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.